Amen. Praise God. And we're back today in the book of Acts chapter number 2. I want to thank God for Pastor Brannigan. Oh my, I was so blessed last Sunday just sitting here and hearing the word of God from him. How many of you were encouraged last week and the week before? Amen. Praise God. Just always grateful for him and his ministry among us and, you know, his willingness to serve, his willingness to, you know, just be a vessel for God. I thank God so much for him and his wife, even as they continue in the youth stepping up. If you have a child or you, there's a child in your community that needs special care, see Pastor Brannigan, see Sister Crystal, all right? They have a ministry every week for kids, for teens, not teens, well, younger ones, and I think some teens, you know, just younger ones, but you want to see him, you want to keep praying for you, stepping up. It's a great ministry to sow into if you're asking God how to spend your extra coins and what you should do with it. I'll tell you, sow into this ministry because they're reaching children on the island for Christ. Amen? Amen. Acts chapter number 2. Praise God. We're going to read in a second, but before we read, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever ventured to build a house before? Let me see you wave your hand. You have tried to build a home. Amen. Amen. The rest of you are smart. You just decided to buy one, right? Or you're thinking about buying one. How many of you have ever built anything? Maybe even a... Uh, oh, oh, what, a doghouse, uh, something you've seen. Oh, you, okay, how many of you have seen something built before? Amen. What is the first thing that you need if you're going to build something? A what? A plan, a plan, a plan. Amen. Unless you're like me. I like to build things just without a plan. And I can tell you, I probably take twice or three times the amount of time because if I had just stopped to come up with a plan sometimes it could have been a do done a lot sooner right babe yes <laughs> and she reminds me of that she reminds me of that every time but in order to build it's very important that we know how to build not just how to build but in the process of building it's very important to know what we are building and many of us are trying to build this perfect life. Or we're trying to build a life that, you know, people can um, look and say, I've lived a successful life. But in order to build a life that is successful, not in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of God, we have to build God's way. And I want to remind you today that each of us are building something. You're building a life that either your family could follow your loved ones could follow or a life that if they do follow you, they'll end up in the wrong path. So be careful how you build this morning. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And I'd like for us to read from verse number 36 all the way down to verse 47. Acts chapter 2 from verse 36 all the way down to verse number 47. Um, if you have found it, um, I would love you to join me. Acts chapter 2. 36 down to verse number 47 let's go together the Bible declares therefore let the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ next verse now now when they heard this they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the Apostles Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call verse 40 and with many other words did he testify and exhort saying save yourselves from this untoward generation then they that gladly received his word were baptized the same day there were added unto them about somebody say three thousand 
How many? Wow. Keep reading. Verse number 43. 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and parted with them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Father, this is your church. We are your people, dear God. We humble our hearts before you right now. And we ask that your abiding presence, O oh God, will speak to us this morning. Thank you for the power of your word. Lord, your word has the authority in our lives. And we welcome you, Spirit of God, to teach us from your word. Be magnified here in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. It really matters how we build. You know, the building I'm speaking of this morning is not just your physical home. The building we're speaking of today is not just the home that you're used to or not just your personal life. But the building today that we want to look at is building God's kingdom. The people of God for years have always been about serving God and desiring His will. Many of us may even think about the times in our past when, you know, we have gone contrary to the will of God. For those of you who are human beings, right, we would know that we haven't always been faithful to God. Is that true? There have been seasons in our life where God had to chase us with a mop stick. Why a mop stick? I'll tell you why a mop stick. Because growing up, I was very hardened. Anybody know what the word hardened means? Miserable, disgusting, troublesome. And in my earlier years, my mom tried very hard to get me to be obedient. And her weapon of choice, not weapon of choice, but yes, <laughs> was a mop stick. Because when all else fails, she will draw for the mop stick. She's not here this morning. Keep praying for her, my dad there in Antigua as the minister there with my sister. But I said that to say sometimes God has also a stick for us as children of God. You don't believe me? The Bible says who God loves, he chastens. And there's something about loving someone that compels you to do whatever necessary to draw them or lead them on the right path. Again, I'm not advocating for abuse. I'm just talking about loving correction. Because some of you are going to say, but pastor, you are talking about abuse. No. But in our text this morning, we are familiar with Acts chapter 2. For those of you who have been here, we've been studying through the entire book of Acts. It's taken us some time, but we're in verse number 2 and we're wrap, chapter number 2 and we're actually wrapping up this chapter. So far, we see that God told the people of God, go to Jerusalem and wait for me because I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. I'm leaving, but my Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to indwell you. And the Spirit of God, when he comes upon you, will give you power to do my will. So the Bible says 120 of them, they went up to the upper room, they sat there for days and they prayed and they waited for the Spirit of God, but we saw that this wasn't something that they were doing because, just because God asked them to, but the, we saw the fulfillment of this was also prophetic, in that God ordained that on the day of Pentecost, after the 50th year, that God promised that He will allow His Spirit to come at the opportune time. So while he got there and they were waiting, the Spirit of God came. And the Bible says he 
filled them. He filled the room with a sound like a mighty wind. And the word began to say, and they be all, 120 of them, began to speak in tongues. And we understood that the word tongues there in the original language meant what? Languages. And they were able to communicate the word of God to the people from different nations who were there in Jerusalem. Insomuch that the Bible says that they began to say among themselves, isn't these Galileans? How come we're hearing them speaking, Jesus, they're Jewish people? How come we're hearing the word of God preached in our own language? And they were amazed. And this was a miracle of God. This was the coming of the Spirit of God that allowed His power to be manifested in a tangible way that the people who heard the words that they spoke will know that only God could do that. Isn't it amazing that our God still work miracles? Isn't it amazing that our God can still do the impossible? And as they went through this process, even while they were there, the Bible says that Peter being filled with the Spirit of God, was moved to say something. Why? Because the people were saying that they were drunk. And you say, we're not drunk. This is just the third hour. It's early in the day. We, we don't usually get drunk so early in the day. What are you talking about? Some of you, you know. I'm going to leave that right there. But I must say, the Bible says, the sin is not drinking, the sin is drunkenness. All right? And being intoxicated with this, being controlled by another spirit. And the Word of God will go on to say that Peter got up and said, hey, man, we ain't drunk. But what you're seeing here is what was prophesied by Joel. This was given to us hundreds of years ago. Remember the Old Testament scriptures that was given. And this today is a fulfillment of that prophecy. And what God was doing, as we know, God was bringing his entire body into one union. He was taking from among them the walls of division, the walls of separation. And the Bible says in that moment, he baptized them into the body of God. Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, people from every nation, all that trusted in Jesus Christ in that moment was included in the body of Christ. And that was a beautiful sign for us that we know that Jesus included us. And now as they got to the end of, as Peter began to speak, he began to tell them, listen, you're the reason why Jesus Christ was crucified. You're the one who pierced him. You're the one who hung him there on the cross, verse number 36. And Peter said to them that you have crucified the Messiah, who is both Lord and Christ. Now, mind you, this is the very message that Jesus died for. When he claimed to be the Messiah, they crucified him. So for Peter to come back and start preaching the same message, he was looking for another crucifixion. But God gave him boldness. God gave him utterance. God filled him with his spirit. Today, God is still giving his people boldness. Today, God still wants to fill us with his spirit. Today, God still wants to use us to declare the gospel of truth to a world that needs to be saved. And the Bible will go on to say, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. In other words, think of it this way. So, like they were stabbed in their heart. The conviction of the word of God. Let me tell you something. The Bible says the word of God is powerful. It's sharp. It's that quick, sharp pain that we experience. That, that, that overwhelming leading of the spirit of God. There's nothing like the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works through His Word, the Word of God. And when they heard it, they were pricked in their heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, verse 27, 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And what Peter told them, he said, repent. In other words, get saved. Confess that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Run to the cross and accept the Christ on the cross. Accept the provision for your life. 
Jesus died so that your sins can be forgiven. And friends, just like those who were there, we too have come to accept Jesus' provision. We believe in our heart that he not only was wounded for our transgressions, not only was he bruised for our iniquities, but all our sin were put upon him. But by his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah said it. He prophesied it. And in the New Testament, we saw it fulfilled that Jesus is the Messiah that came into this world. And the Bible says, Peter told him, repent, get baptized, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And verse 39 says, the promise is not just for you who are near, but all those who are far. And we are the far off because the Jews thought that they were the only ones who were included in the promise. But Jesus said, no. I'm going to go to the nations beyond. And that's why I fill them with the gift of tongues so that they can go and take the gospel without any limitation into nations of the world that never heard the gospel preached before in their own language. So now we get to verse number 40. And I'm just recapping what we already covered, right? And the Bible says right here is where we're going to pick up this morning. And I hope you brought your Bibles with you. By the way, I want to thank the person who owns my Bible, my preaching Bible, that, you know, every now and again you use it and then you bring it back and then you leave it in the sanctuary and you take it whenever you want to. I want to say to you, I appreciate you very much, but I saw it last Sunday for the first time in a very long while and then it disappeared again this Sunday. But um, if you need a Bible, please let me know. I'll gladly give you one, but that's my special preaching Bible. So can you bring it back to me, please? <laughs> With love. <laughs> With real love. <laughs> And I know it's an accident, but if you really love it, you can have it, by the way. You can have it. So verse number 40, and many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. And the Bible says that they, were, they that received his word were baptized that same day and were added unto them about how many, church? 3,000 souls. Can you imagine preaching a sermon and 3,000 people respond to the gospel? Wow. Remember, they went from 120 to how many? 3,120. Just like that. Why? Because the word of God was declared. And this is God building his church. Mind you, Jesus said that I will build my church. And why this is so important to realize, Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18, you run there with me. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And why this is so very important for us to remember, people of God, is because the building is in the hands of God. It is not up to us to build God's church. Aren't you grateful? I'm so grateful because if it was left up to me, I'll build a big mess. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. If it was left up to me to build the lives of people or you and I, we would create even more confusion. But Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter. Yes, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And what this simply means is Jesus is saying, I will build my church and Satan and his angels cannot destroy it. Listen, people of God, the church is the greatest force on planet earth. There's nobody like the church of the living God. So who's the church? The Bible said they're a called out group of believers. They're not the building, neither are we just congregations that gather. We are the people who believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are also the people who believe in the return of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Why is this important to know? Because many people come looking for the church and what they find is the Antichrist spirit. 
There are many buildings that says this church and that church and this Baptist church or that Pentecostal church or this Nazarene church and that or the other. And unfortunately, in those buildings, sometimes there aren't many or if any true believers in Jesus Christ. The church is a called out group of believers separated from this world and separated unto God. How do you know if you're a part of the church? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those who believe that Jesus Christ came into this world as our Savior and placed their faith in him, the word says we move from death now into life. And friends, God says to us without apology, I will build my church. So if God's going to build his church, he has to give us the blueprint. And you know what? The blueprint is found right here in the word of God. And we're going to uncover this morning what is the blueprint for building a church God's way. First thing we know is that he is the chief builder. He's the one who's in charge. He's the foreman. He's everything that we need to build the church. Then let's look at our text now. The Bible says that in Revelation chapter 3, I want you to go there. Because many times in our churches, we try to build. And sometimes we start off building the right way. So what's the first stage of building? Anybody knows? The foundation. If your foundation is no good, then let me tell you, that building will be rocky for many years. The Bible speaks about someone who built their house on sand, and the rains came, and the floods, and the house on the sand went destroyed. But the Bible speaks about those who will build on the rock. That's why when they're building any sensible, strong structure, they pour concrete. Amen? They make sure that it's built on some type of solid foundation. What is the solid foundation? We're building the foundation now of the church. God is talking about how his church should be built. Because here's why. If you deviate from the blueprints of the foundation, the building, when you get to the top, you will realize sometimes it lean a little bit to the left, right, Brother Devon? Or lean a little bit to the right, right, Brother Mike? And you have to compensate here for a couple inches there and here for a couple inches there. And before you know it, you're trying to figure out where did we go wrong? We went wrong with the foundation. If a church is going to be the type of church, watch this now, that the gates of hell will not prevail against, can you say and agree with me that we have to build God's way? Because if we're not building God's way, let me tell you this, the gates of hell will prevail. Because God is only concerned about the church that wants to be built His way. According to His blueprint. According to His divine will. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. And here's this verse. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things said he that had the seven spirits of God. And the seven stars, and we're talking about Jesus here. Jesus is now writing to the angel of the church. In other words, the pastor of the church, the leader, the shepherds of this church. This is God's words to the church in Sardis, all right? Here's what he said. I what? Talk to me, church. Go back, go back. Not too fast. Back to verse number one. He said, I know thy works. Okay. What are your works? He says that you has a name that you live, but you are dead. Ooh. In other words, people think that you're alive. People come in and they see vibrant worship in churches, or singing rather, because worship isn't singing. Are you with me this morning? We confuse the boat. 
We think that if there is talent, if there is gifting, and if there is great performance, that there is worship. Jesus said, no way. They that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. And that's why we encourage you when you get here to set aside the self and the pride and the sin and focus on God for who he is. And the Bible says that God said, I came to your church, Sadis. I came to your church, way of the cross. And you had a name that you are alive. But when I examine, not the building, not the music, not the messages, but when I examine who the people are, you're dead. Is that true of us? Is that true of us? Why are you dead? Verse number two would say it like this. Go there quickly with me. Be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. In other words, God's, God is saying here, listen, I'm, I'm examining your blueprint. And your foundation looks like it's good, but it's not good. It's so rocky that when I think about you, you are looking the part. You act right but you live wrong. You know, in, the, in your heart of hearts, people of God, what God is saying to us is that we have learned how to fake it. Because they say fake it till you make it. But God say if you are not honest, you can never make it. The Christian life is built on truth. God's word is the truth. That's why when he say I will build my church. I'm building my church on my truth. You know what? God's truth doesn't change. Bible says God's word is forever. It's forever settled in heaven. It's also settled in earth. So that means though people's opinions change today, or people's preferences change, or people's ideologies or belief system change, God says my word remains the same so how do we build church what is the foundation the word of God this is how we build no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid of Christ and Christ is saying because this is my church I'm given the blueprint and the blueprint starts and it ends with the word even the apostle Paul said listen if an angel come down beside you and say to you something else other than what's written in the word of God. He said, listen, that's not an angel, but that's a devil. That's a demon. Because what's happening in the church today is everybody has a vision. Oh, I had a revelation. I ate 10 bucks of KFC last night. And when I went home, I got this dream. And in this dream, God said to me to go down to the river and lay hands on the river and split it in two. Vision. This is what we do. This is what we do. And that might sound extreme, but sometimes we, we say things, oh, God, give me this dream, and God, give me this. Listen, I'm not saying God can't give you a dream. I'm not saying God don't still give visions, but make sure your visions and dreams line up with this book, okay? Else don't share it to anybody. As thus said the Lord. Because the Bible said there's a generation that's looking for a sign. And you know what that's called? Witchcraft. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. There are those out there who go after psychics. And they go after other mediums trying to find what their future looks like. And before you know it, all they find is dead ends and destruction. But God says, if you want truth, find it in my words. Be watchful. Way of the cross, what should we be? Watchful, watchful of what? Watchful of the things that should remain truth in your word. And that we are found before God as honoring to him. 
be watchful. Your foundation should be strong. Your family should be built on the Word of God. Our home should be built on the Word of God. And God said, I went looking for a church, but you had all these activities. You had all these programs. You had all these different things to reach the community, reach the lost, gatherings and sessions where people could come and enjoy themselves and learn this and learn that. But he said to them, I really don't know you. I don't know what you're doing, but it's not of me. It's for your glory. And as I read this passage, the Spirit of God began to convict me and began to say to me, watch, pastor, how you build, because you have to build God's way. It's not about what programs are needed. It's about the presence of God. Like Moses said, God, if you will not go in with us, I don't want to go nowhere. God, if you're not building with us, I don't want to build nothing. God, if you're not moving among us, I don't want to move. And this is where our heart must be resolved in the fact that God, if you're not in my life, if you're not in my family's life, if you're not leading me, God, then I'm not going. You know what our problem is as a church? We want to go ahead of God. We want to tell God what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And Lord, bless me in the process of doing it. But God says, I'm not your little robot. I am God. Let's build his way. Back to our text. He says, Acts chapter 2. So if we're going to build God's church God's way, first of all, we need an appropriate, uh, the appropriate content. What is the appropriate content? The Bible says that after their hearts were pricked, in verse 42, they continued steadfastly, look at it now, what's the appropriate content for the church? In the apostles' doctrine. What is doctrine? Teachings of the word of God. Doctrines are from scripture, biblical principles, biblical foundation. The church is built on doctrines that are set there by God to guide us away from sin and draw us closer to him. You see, friends, for some people, doctrine is like a bad word. It's like, why are you always talking doctrine? Why the church always talking a doctrine? I feel this, and I sense this, and I know this, and I understand this. Listen, if we keep chasing rabbits, we will find Bugs Bunny. <laughs> but if we chase after the word of God, we will find the God of the word. And what God is encouraging us in this season to do as human beings who say, I want to know God, is to get plugged in. I'm not saying this is the only church that preaches the word. But I want to say to you, if you're going to a church and they're not teaching, thus said the word of God, and they're not opening the scriptures and rightly, expositorily going through the word of God, teaching the word of God, then run the moment we stop teaching the word of God here, I'll tell you what, what's going to happen. The Bible says God will have no reason to be among us. And this is why we have to watch. This is why we have to guard. This is why we have to fight to ensure that the solid foundation of the word of God remains sure. They continued. What did they do? After those who believed, Peter preached up a storm. Yes. Yes. And the Bible says he told them, believe and be baptized, and they will be saved. But look what the verse says, and they what? What's the big word there, church? Continued. What is happening today is many people are saying that they believe with tears running down their eyes, but they don't continue. Can I show you a scripture? You say, well, I pray the prayer, and I ask Christ into my life, and I am a Christian because I believe. Look what John chapter 8 and verse 30 says. Follow me there, people of God. As we look at building God's way and the appropriate content, 
the first thing we see about this content that you have to believe the church was saved. But look at verse number 30 of John chapter 8. And as he spake these words, this is Jesus now. He just got through preaching and a sermon. And as he spoke the words that came out of his mouth, look at verse number 31. Then said Jesus to the Jews, which what? Which what? Which what church? So we have Jews now that believed on Jesus because of the words that he preached. Look what he said to them. If you what? If you what? In my words, look at this now. Then are ye my disciples. Do you see the difference? There are those who will believe. The Bible says even the demons believe and tremble. But they believe, but their belief has no faith behind of it. Faith without works is dead. We are not saved by works. We are saved by his work on the cross of Calvary that purchased our redemption. That's how we are saved, by what Jesus did. But if we believe on him, the evidence that we truly believe is that we will continue. So what does the Word of God teach us? All those who are truly saved will be eternally saved. Why? Because those who truly believe will continue. So it's not just about believing. It's about believing, but by placing your faith in Christ and continuing daily to steadfastly follow Him. Okay, that's one scripture, Pastor. All right, let me show you the next scripture. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. Let's go there. 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 19. Y'all know we do Bible study in this church, amen? The Bible says, verse 19. Jesus again. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no Doubt have what? See there again? Continued what? With us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that what? What does it tell us? If you truly believe, you will remain faithful to God. That doesn't mean you'll be perfect. Let me just say that. Because all have sin. All will sin. But here's what will guide your heart and life. The overwhelming presence of God will lead you that when we fall into sin, the Spirit of God will convict us so that we will repent of our sins and we will continue following God. I want to say this to you. God is the God that pursues you wherever you are. If in your life you truly believe on Jesus Christ and you receive him as Lord and Savior, and for whatever reason you've been down a path that's contrary to God and you're struggling, but you know in your heart that his presence is there and he's convicting you. And the Bible says what we do as a child of God sometimes is that we quench the spirit of God because of sin in our lives. But that doesn't mean his presence is not with us, but we break the fellowship that we have with God. The relationship is intact, but the fellowship is broken. And as a result of the fellowship being broken, what occurs in our life is simply this. We stray further and further away from God. But God, with his cords of love, draws us back. He pulls us back into his presence. Those that are his, the Bible says, he will lose none of them. We're eternally secured in Christ. But the big question is, are you truly saved? Because where, how we build matters. And the reason we build according to God's blueprint, because according to God's blueprint, he said that his church that will never be um, prevailed by Satan and his, his emissaries, the Bible says that this church is a saved church. They have been redeemed. They have been called and separated as unto God. Not only are they a saved church, we see from this, this, go back to our text now, thank you so much. I want to give God thanks for our young people. Man, they, 
I know I give them a round around so many times with finding these scriptures, but they are so amazing that every Sunday they come and they serve and they help out wherever they can. So God bless you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. You're making a difference. The Bible says not only were they saved, but the early church was a spirit-filled church. Where do we see that? The word says, when the Holy Spirit came upon the church, right, they began to do these great things for the kingdom of God. And the filling of the Spirit empowers us as believers to accomplish the divine will of God. And after they got saved, the Bible says that they began to, 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 they, they, they knew Jesus Christ, but when they got filled now, they were given boldness. Boldness unlike they have ever had before. Because these men, prior to this day, they were hiding out around the place when Jesus died. But when they realized that he rose from the dead and he granted them his power, they are a totally different group of people. And I'm saying to you today, Christ in us makes the difference. Child of God, Christ in you gives you power to overcome even the most difficult temptations in life. They are spirit-filled because they allow the Holy Spirit to control their lives. Church, how much of our lives does God have under his control? Okay, you don't know? Let me, let me, let me help you figure this out. How much of your tongue does God have under control? Let's ask your wife or let's ask your husband. Let's ask your neighbor or let's ask your co-worker. Huh? I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I'm spirit-filled. How spirit-filled is your tongue? How spirit-filled is your eyes, men and women? What are we looking at? You know, and I, let, let me tell you something. It's becoming increasingly difficult to watch a sensible movie. In fact, my wife and I have been determined that the only movies we've been allowing our daughter to watch in recent times is the movies that we saw growing up. <laughs> the other night, we watched The Sounds of Music. How many of you know that movie? How many of you watched that movie? Classic, right? When everything was so innocent and everything was so pure, nowadays, they, they just they mess everything up, man. You know what I mean? So it's so hard to watch something that's sensible. It matters what we watch. Men, it matters what we watch on our phones when our wives are not around, when we're scrolling on Facebook. TikTok. Church quiet now, Brother Belgrave. <laughs> Before, I, you know, they were with me, but all of a sudden they're not with me. Because if, be, if they were with me, they would continue. But they didn't continue, they stopped, you know. Yeah. We have, men, we got to guard our eyes. Women, we got to guard our eyes too. Because the devil is after the flesh. And the enemy is at work in your flesh. And if you think you're at match for the enemy, you're not. The Bible says your flesh will fail you. So how much of our flesh does God have under control? How much of a tongue does God have under control? Let me ask a different one. How much of your finances does God have under his control? Because somebody said, until you hit my pocket, God, you don't really hit me. Can God trust us to be good stewards of what he has given to us? Can God trust us? To use what he has given to us for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. And many Christians are in lack simply because we've been robbing God. How have you robbed me? Malachi says, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. You've robbed me because you've withheld from me that which is mine that I've given to you that I want to multiply. So God doesn't want to take anything from you. Watch this now, church, because he needs it. God asks us to give so that he can take what we give and multiply it. But some of us base the way we give on how we feel. But I'm so loud to God. I'm a Christian. 
I'm serving God, but my tongue isn't under control. My body isn't under subjection. My mind isn't under subjection. My thoughts aren't under subjection. And God is saying, I'm battling with you, child of God, because I've given you my Holy Spirit to fill you, to empower you to be a vessel for me. But you're allowing the flesh to fill your life. And you're allowing another spirit to take control of you. A spirit of fear sometimes as Christians. We're struggling with the song this morning says, I'm no longer a slave to fear. And as soon as you got through singing that song, how many of you started to think about the fear that you had? When you leave here this morning, will you really remember that song? That scripture that it's not about the fear of men, but it's about the reverence of God. And the early church understood if they were going to build God's way and if they were going to be a church that is built on a solid foundation that the appropriate content is necessary so the the early church believed in salvation. They were a spirit-filled church. But thirdly, they were also steadfastly teaching the word of God. Verse number 42 says they continued in the apostles' doctrine. What the apostles taught to them, which was the word of God, this is what they taught to their children and their children's children. You know what we teach today? The very same thing. We preach Christ and Christ crucified. To the world, this is foolishness. But for those of us who have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, this is the best that we can ever give. So they steadfastly, look at verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. So they steadfastly taught the word of God. Even Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, verse 13, he said, Timothy, until I come, give yourself to teaching the word. Give yourself to learning the word. Give yourselves to preaching the word. But then look at the latter part of verse number 42. Not only did they continue in the apostles' doctrine, but they continued steadfastly in fellowship. So we think fellowship is everybody coming to church and eat food, right? That's real fellowship. My belly agrees that that's real fellowship. And very soon, um, what's the day, Sister Denise, that we're doing this taste of the world? Let me put a plug in here of it. When is it? Anybody remember? All right, if y'all can't remember, look at the church bulletin. I don't remember. But we're very soon, we're having a taste of the world. And after service, we're going to be all outside fellowshipping over bread. But when the Bible talks about fellowship and breaking bread here, what is referred to is the Lord's table, the communion. Doing this in remembrance of him. Looking back and saying, Lord, look at what you've done for us on the cross. So as a result, we honor you because of what you did. And the fellowship here also had to do with that Greek word koinonia, which has to do with gathering together and loving on each other. Listen, do you know why we emphasize things like the rooted groups at this church? which is beginning to start. By the way, if you have not plugged into the Rooted Groups, I'm going to put another plug here. We are beginning very soon, within the next week. And if you have not signed up for it, you need to sign up. But this now takes a larger church and makes us smaller as we grow together in smaller dynamic groups and we go out to share the love of Christ. But the early church, this is how they met. They met in homes, they met in families, they sat and they spent time together in the word of God. And they fellowshiped and they ate and they drank and they did all that good stuff. But the idea here is that because we love each other, we genuinely love each other, we want to be around each other. Now picture this, we're talking about 3,120 people. Do you think everybody in that church knew everybody? Do you know everybody in this church? No? Right? But they found a way to gather in smaller groups to be able to fellowship with one another. Friends, let me say this to you. You were not meant to serve God alone. Many of you come to church and you're like, I don't like that church, I don't like this church. What are you talking about? Are you talking about the service? Are you talking about the sermon? What are you talking about? Do you know anybody else in the church? Have you stepped out of your comfort zone to say, hey, brother, sister, nice to meet you. Can we do lunch? 
can we do dinner? You know, can you talk to me about my faith? And those of you who are old in this church and who've been here for a while, please make it your business to demonstrate the love of Christ by being a vessel so somebody else can pour into, somebody else can receive from. They stayed steadfast in fellowship, but not only that, look at the last part of this verse. It says, and in prayers. Wow. Do you see the blueprint? They were saved. They were spirit-filled. They were steadfast in the word of God. They were steadfast in fellowship. But we see the final thing here. That they spent time in prayer. Wow. If God were to judge, no, look, in context, this is speaking about corporate prayer. This is not individual, private prayer. This is the church gathering together, whether it be in smaller groups or larger groups. They gathered corporately together to pray. Jesus said, I will build my church. But he also said, my church shall be called a house of prayer. We have the cross. We have failed in this area. We have not given ourselves to enough time in corporate prayer. And even as I worked through this passage and God worked on my heart, there are some things that God began to remind. I know we have... I know we have um, Thursday morning prayer time at 6. I know the small groups meet and we pray. And we have different prayer sessions that the men get together to pray. The women may get together to pray. And different things are happening. But I'm saying as a church, we have denied the power of prayer. At least that's how I feel as a pastor. Tell me if I'm wrong. And why do I say that, right? Here's why I say that. Because what prayer does is prayer says that I have removed myself and my abilities from the equation. I have removed my ability to plan, which is what we do well of. We do well with planning, strategizing, organizing, building this committee, building this group. But as children of God, we plan first and pray after. And I don't see it in the Bible. The people who are filled with the Spirit of God, they pray first. And they plan after. So this is what we do. We make our plans and then we say, God bless it. God lead me in the direction. But you already made up your mind. I've made up my mind. And God says, why don't you go to me what? Why? Because he could tell the future. He got it figured out. He knows the beginning from the ending. And I'm saying to us, sometimes the best thing we can do in the middle of our plans is stop. And ask God to lead us. Is God leading your decisions, church? Are you making plans without God? Plans to get married without God? But Lord, he's so handsome and he's so tall. And God, he got money. Oh God, she's so beautiful. Oh God, it's just a conversation. Are you, are you pursuing something? Because it seems like it's the right thing. Where is the Holy Spirit in the midst of it. A couple months ago, I was speaking to a brother, a pastor, and he was sharing with me all these wonderful plans. And I asked him, so what did God do to confirm these plans to you? And he, he was like, huh? He's like, God has given me the ability to make these plans, and this is what I believe God is doing. I said, okay, great. But did you ask him? Did you ask him? Children of God, do you know that the Holy Spirit wants us to talk to him? Do you know that God provides to us the Spirit of God that will teach us all things? And do you know God desires to have a personal relationship with us? Do you know that God wants to meet with you? Do you know that God wants to reveal himself to you? Do you know that prayer is not just you talking to God, but also God speaking back to you? 
It's communicating with God. And what we do, we rush into the presence of God. God, give me, give me, give me it up for me. This is mine. I need this. I need that. I need that. God, this. God, this. I want this. This husband. Oh, Lord, this marriage. God, bless this business. God, I need this. And God said, wait, 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 wait. And we shut the door and we go. God's like, who you for you just talked to? You didn't talk to me. How many of us will allow somebody to do that to us? In, in, in like a physical person to come to us and say, blah, 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 blah. We won't do it. So why do we treat God so? The Bible says, you will seek me and find me when you have searched for me with all your heart. People of God, give yourself the gift of waiting until you hear from God in prayer to proceed with any decision in life. It will save us many troublesome days. The early church had the blueprint. They knew if they were going to prosper, they had to be built and founded on the simple principle that they must be saved. They must be a church that's spirit-filled. They must be a church that's steadfastly spending time teaching the Word of God. They were also a church that fellowship together and a church that stayed committed in prayer. Could it be that the reason our faith is weak is simply because we don't believe in God enough to pray? Huh? Let me, let me, get, let me, let me just say this, guys. I know what it means to pray and ask God for something and it doesn't come true. That can break your faith. But prayer is not God giving to us everything we ask. When we go before God and ask, the Bible say, ask and it shall be given to you. But when we ask according to his will, those of you who are parents, you don't just give your children everything they want because they feel like they want it, because they think that it's good for them. You do understand that sometimes you have to tell your children no. And there are times that the best thing God has ever done for me, glory to God, is tell me no. Because had I gotten a yes, boy, monkey better than me. I'm saying this to say, people of God, don't try to live your Christian life without God. Does that make sense? Because we can do that. You could build your life around the pastor. You could build your life around what is being said by other leaders. You could build your life around everything else but God. You know why we are here? And I hope you know this. I'm not here for my own glory or my own praise. I'm here to just reflect the glory of God. That's it. That's all I want to do. I just want people to see Christ in me and through me. And God wants our lives to be a vessel. So why was the church created? To bring glory to God. That's it, full stop. So if we're going to bring glory to God, if your life is going to bring glory to God, in spite of your physical condition, in spite of your working state, in spite of your financial you know, struggles, if your life is going to bring glory to God, we got to get back to saying to God, it's okay to say no to me, God. But if you say, wait, God, I don't mind waiting. I'll wait till you say wait. And for some of us, sometimes we get confused when God says, wait. We think that wait means no. But God says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I wonder this morning, what would it take for us to say to God, in my own life, help me, dear God, to build your way. With every head bow, every eye close. You know, even as I end this message this morning, I want to say to you that as a church, we are looking forward in the very near future. True God's willing and his leading to build a large auditorium. Not so that we can have a bigger church, but so that we can accommodate 
the church that God Amen. I don't think the enemy wanted me to say that probably. But God is building his church. And I believe that all of you here, there are more than 120 of us. And I want to say this to, to this church, right? That God took 120 people. And by the time you get to chapter 4, which we will get there, God's willing, we find that there's 5,000. And then when you get a little later on, two chapters later, you find that that went to 20,000 people. I wonder what will really happen if the people of God will go back to the heart of God. And say, God, whatever I'm doing in this season, whatever I'm building in this season there, God, if you're not building it, I don't want to bail. I wonder if we will go before God today and say, God, take your time with me. And give me patience. Teach me patience. Teach me to wait on you, dear God. Teach me, dear God, to trust you with all my heart.